Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us. Thanks for coming in person, too. It's good to be back in front of actual live humans. Uh, my name is Kyle Roach. I work for AWS. I run an organization called Immersive Technology. Uh, we cover all the, the game tech products, all the media and entertainment products like Nimble Studio, Thinkbox, uh, Location Service, uh, and a bunch of other kind of fun tools, too. Uh, today, we're here to talk about uh, content production specifically. I'm joined by two other speakers. Uh, Katrina King will follow me uh, next. She's a special solutions essay uh, working on media and entertainment. Has about 20 years experience doing everything from content production to editing to, to visual effects and animation. And then following, we have a, a customer who flew all the way out here from Australia, Jerry Travers, CEO of Pop Family Entertainment. He's going to talk about a new feature they're working on, how they're using AWS, Amazon Nimble Studio, and some of their tools to move their pipeline uh, to the cloud and make that, make that all possible. So here's kind of a quick rundown of the agenda. So I'll start, like I said, with an overview of kind of content production, some of the initiatives that we launched in 2021. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about Nimble Studio uh, and updates on some of the features that uh, came out in the last couple months. Uh, Katrina will follow again, to talk about some, some of the solutions to implement these cloud-based workflows in the cloud. Uh, and then Jerry will finish it up with uh, kind of the fun and entertaining stuff. So. All right, so I wanna make sure I touch on this. This is an initiative we launched uh, right around April this year. Uh, and you know, we get feedback from customers all the time that there's a lot of solutions. There's a lot of partner solutions. There's do-it-yourself solutions, builder guides. You know, AWS has different services, obviously. And how do I get started, right? So we, we, we came up with this initiative called AWS for M&E. And it's specifically targeted at content creators, rights holders, producers, broadcasters, and distributors to kind of give them a navigate, navigatable roadmap on how to find and implement solutions uh, depending on what they're looking to do. So it covers all nine of the AWS fully managed services, over a dozen of our solutions and guides that we put together on how to do things yourself, and over 200 different partner solutions across five different uh, pillars, content production, media supply chain and archive, broadcast, direct to consumer and streaming, and data science and analytics for media. So this is a great program, it's a great initiative. Uh, so if you haven't checked that out, it's a great way to kind of see the partner offerings that are out there and what's available to you on AWS. All right, so specifically, we're gonna to focus today on the content production pillar, um, as the name of the session would suggest. Um, and I, I wanted to start with kind of a, a short sizzle reel. Like our customers, AWS customers, create animated content, visual effects that really push the boundaries of what's imaginable in the cloud. Uh, customers like Method Studios, Tangent Animation, Barnstorm, Pop Family Entertainment, and they render amazing stuff with Thinkbox Deadline. They use a number of other services like Nimble Studio, FSX, uh, the Snow family of devices. S3 and EC2. So I just wanted to spend a minute kind of running through some of their projects, and uh, this is the new updated uh, sizzle reel that we, we put out for reInvent. How do you like it so far? Uh, wait, I did click it. Thanks for watching that. Uh, that last shot I'll talk specifically about, that was done by an internal studio in AWS, the shot where uh, the character Noah jumps off a bridge. Um, so look, content production and, and, and media and entertainment is not really new for us. We've been making active and, and large investments in this space for years. It you know, started with Elemental back in 2015 to help with content and coding and delivery. We acquired uh, Amazon Thinkbox specifically for their deadline product to manage uh, rendering on the cloud. That's uh, free if you use it on AWS. 
That was back in 2017. 2019, we, we acquired a company called Amazon, or Nimble, they're, now they're Amazon Nimble Studio, but they were called Nimble uh, Collective before that. And that, that became the launch of uh, Nimble Studio, which is a, a product we'll talk about in a minute. So specifically, I also wanted to mention, not a lot of people know this, but we, all, you know, as part of the Nimble Studio acquisition, we picked up a team of super talented, kind of world-class artists. And instead of kind of moving them over to studios or doing something like in the branding team, we kept them within AWS and we created a team called Fuzzy Pixel. So what Fuzzy Pixel does, their charter is really to, to be a customer. So they, they make you know, one to three very large focused projects a year to push the boundary of what's possible in the cloud. Uh, there's a short that we released last year called Spanner, and that's where that bridge shot came from. Uh, Spanner's broken down, there's a, a number of sessions at, uh, at SIGGRAPH last summer where we broke down how we did a bunch of the different uh, parts of that show, and we continue to, to publish to something called our artist blog on AWS that breaks down all the shots. We open sourced a lot of the content, so you can kind of mess with that and do some of the renders yourself. So it's great to check it out. If you want to see the short, there's a bit.ly link. It's just bit.ly slash uh, AWS spanner. So. Now, aside from just investments on acquisitions, you know, we, we want to focus on the community. I think this has been a, a new thing for us, too, and something we've been actively focused on lately with AWS. So I'm really excited this year about some of the work we've been doing with the Academy Software Foundation. Uh, we made, we're making large investments into women in animation. We'll be doing a bunch of 22 events in person with that group to, to, drive, to drive their initiatives. Uh, and then we're uh, one of the premier partners for, for the Blender Foundation, which was a great investment last year. Specifically, we're using um, our investment in Blender to focus on uh, their animation tool sets and things like that. So. All right, so a couple, couple trends that we saw through 2021, and you know, I guess 2020 also. First one, remote production has just been, you know, now it's kind of the new way we're working, right? I think, you know, with the way work had to change, we you know, came up with a couple of different things. Studios that, that were already working on the cloud were able to continue working the day after everybody kind of went home. Uh, it took a little bit for other people to get there, but now, you know, hybrid at best is kind of the environment that we're all working within. So, you know, remote production and getting art artists on virtual workstations is a super important trend that's been uh, actively uh, focused on this year. And then with people home, the demand for consumer content is rising also. So more, more content's driving more need for more production, and this sort of thing is, you know, cyclical, right? So I, I think building, one of the things we, we want to actively help customers do, and something like Katrina does specifically, is you know, realizing that the pipeline that you built uh, on-prem is very different than the one that you're going to need in the cloud. So there's, there's patterns that are similar, but there's also a lot of change and uh, challenges that come along with that too. The last one's pretty obvious cost. I mean, this is also, this is always a thing with, uh, with M&E, but um, you know, customers want to make sure that when they move to the cloud, the time and the investment is actually better than it was when they had before. And we're not looking at one-to-one -one parts. You have to kind of look at the total cost of ownership here. So we're, we're building a lot of tools to help manage that as well. So some of the components that we saw come out in 2021, like our major areas of focus were uh, basically rendering. That's our, kind of a primary focus that's been on uh, EC2 as a, as a spot-based workload for quite some time. Um, and we wanted that scale and flexibility to apply to your art, art team as well. So you should be able to scale them up just like you do with a uh, render farm. So we've been working on virtual workstations and investing on making sure those are in the areas that you need for your artists. And then the infrastructure that ties all those things together. So there's probably a one-to-one -one relationship with sessions you've attended and seeing this slide. But uh, just, I just wanted to kind of point out where we're actively investing and how that overlays with where media and entertainment and studios are in general. And you'll see that kind of relationship specifically local zones. So local zones, they provide a solution for markets that aren't directly adjacent to uh, one of our bigger data centers, and it's a great way to kind of you know, get your artists closer, uh, lower latency workstations, but still use a, a regular uh, data center for your hub and for your data sharing and things like that. There's a ton of these coming this year, too. All right, so um, this isn't really a specific launch at reInvent, but these were just announced. I just wanted to make sure everybody saw this. Uh, EC2 put out a new GPU instance, the G G5 instance. Um, it has uh, eight A10G GPUs on it, 24 gigs of uh, GPU memory and over 100 gigabits of network bandwidth. This is a great option if you're doing like for heavy graphic workloads, specifically with a game engine, maybe like Unreal or something like that. Uh, it's a good option to explore uh, for virtual workstation usage. Whoops. Okay, well, let me talk a little bit about Amazon Nimble Studio. We launched that earlier this year. Um, so when an artist logs into Amazon Nimble Studio, they should be able to move from their sketch all the way through to animation, to rigging, to lighting and compositing, and then reviewing even the final shot or sequence right, right from their virtual workstation. So all the tools that the artist uses day to day are all part of Amazon Nimble Studio, the, the fully managed solution. So Nimble Studio acts as a central hub for your studio infrastructure and allows you a single point of configuration. <clears throat> 
So when you're deploying Nimble Studio, you have the ability to manage all your users and create accounts for them. Your artists can log in through the, an artist-friendly portal. They don't have to log in through the AWS console. Uh, we re recently launched support for Okta, so if you're using something like that to manage your users, you can use that for authentication as well. Um, they can collaborate remotely because all the infrastructure is in the cloud, obviously. And then you can access uh, the project data you know, th through the scalable file system. So this means that like, you know, as your shots get bigger, as you're sharing more and more data, the workstation just kind of adapt along with you. So, Let's see. Cool. Now, we wanted to make sure that pricing was super simple with Nimble. So what we did is we bundled the things that an artist needs to work, right? So we took the region, the instance size, and the OS of choice. We basically created these bundled pricing, so it's a per hour, per artist uh, fee, and we, we bundled things like uh, your root EBS volume and enough pixel streaming for dual 4K monitors uh, while you're running the workstation. That way you have a predictable price for an artist is working, here's what we should be uh, charged for that. All right, so since the launch of Nimble, we've received tremendous feedback on the service, and we've been working to respond to customer demands, right? So today, uh, it's available in a bunch of different regions. We'll continue to expand that uh, in 22, specifically focused on local zone expansions and m and &E markets. Uh, we're excited to push even further with Nimble Studio, and I wanted to just touch on some of the recent features that we, uh, we launched specifically focused on artists. So when we, when we launched Nimble Studio, one of the ma major points of feedback we got was that our ephemeral workstation model um, required that like, a, a new workstation had to be provisioned uh, by approved AMIs set up by studio admin. So it was very focused on how the studio admin like, would manage uh, the artist's workstations. Wasn't super convenient for an artist. An artist would see you know, anywhere from 10 to sometimes 18 minute startup times when they, when they logged into their machine in the morning. So we got that down to under two minutes with a feature that um, allows uh, artists to stop and start workstations in the middle of their stream. We'll move everything into uh, a volume for them for, so when they come in the next morning, they can grab another instance, reattach, and just keep working where they were the day before. So it's a huge feature, really making the artist's life a lot easier. We also add an API, so you can list kind of your streaming sessions, so you can like, kind of see who's working, what, what instance they're on, get a little bit more visibility into customizations there. And then you can even launch a streaming session from that API as well. So we've seen some really cool stuff with customers like you know, putting webhooks into Slack, so like, hey, I'm coming into work, the workstation gets all ready and waiting for them, or you know, kind of just cool automation, cron jobs to set you up at different times of the day, stuff like that. So it's a great API, and I think it provides a lot of flexibility for, for the artists to kind of work the way they want to. Uh, a couple other things, so when you do stop um, a workstation, any modification or customization done to the environment is now preserved in the CBS volume. That's kind of what creates the ability to stop and start the sessions. Um, specifically, this is super useful if you're using uh, things like Unreal, where you have very, very large scene sizes, and you, know, you might see eight to nine minute kind of load times in the morning. So that pause and restart will just save a lot of time. All right, so one more thing uh, Studio Admins are asking for is basically, like, how do I test these launch profiles? So how Nimble works is that the launch profile it gives the, the specific type of artist. So you can say, like, my animators can use these instances in these regions. Here's how much storage they get. And then when the animator logs in, they just see those machines. So the way to kind of test these profiles and make sure they're, they're active was something that was kind of a laborious process before this feature. So now they can launch them and test them, validate them right from the console. All right, so we're constantly talking to customers. We, we want to hear more about what you all need to, uh, to kind of make Nimble Studio uh, something that, that works well for you. In 22, we'll have a particular focus on uh, usability, usability and collaboration features. Uh, yeah, and we just um, did a couple more things too. I was, was going to quickly mention that um, like Cumula integration, Weka integration on the file system side. So other kind of partner tools that you need access to inside Nimble, please let us know about that as well. And uh, we'll keep launching through 22. So I think Christina is going to come join us to talk about um, some of the options for workflow in the cloud. Thanks, Kyle. So traditionally, cloud-based post-production workflows have been approached as a series of individual workloads. And that's worked to a degree. I mean, you're all here. Thanks for coming. But uh, to really realize the benefits of cloud computing, we need to start approaching post-production in a holistic manner. Post-production workflows typically are greater than the sum of their parts. And they require interconnectivity, agnostic integrations with neighboring processes, and a holistic unified approach from the settings in the camera to the final deliverables. And at AWS, we look at Post in the Cloud as a symbiotic ecosystem of services, partners, independent software vendors, SaaS solutions, and managed media services. And it all really starts with a data lake, or as we like to say in m and &E, a content lake. Oh. 
Um, and from there, that's the core of the hub. And this is your master content repository of running an Amazon Simple Storage service and ultimately archiving in Amazon S3 Glacier. So the next hub out in the wheel is the, um, our core post-production workflows running on Amazon Elastic Compute instances. And it doesn't really matter where they run, whether they're in a studio account or a creative service provider or a vendor. And this includes things like offline editorial, sound, and uh, are we high pop? I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> that includes things like offline editorial, sound, mixing, that kind of thing. And the key to that is that the core tenant of the Movie Lab's 2030 vision that content remain in the cloud and applications come to the content remain true. From there, the next hub out in the, in the wheel represents partner solutions, independent software vendors, SaaS solutions, and AWS managed services that add value to the process. And the, core, the key thing to all of this is it's all interconnected. All of these partners and all of these solutions have been handpicked because they all interconnect with one another and your core architecture as required. So a few examples are Fifth Kind, which is a production asset manager that it integrates directly with your customer buckets. IMT Soda, which manage, makes it really easy to manage media and to move it in between different storage classes. And Deluxe OneDub, for instance, that leverages Amazon CloudFront for remote ADR and, and dubbing. And then the final wheel is external points of integration. And this is things that connect with your on-prem environment, things that connect with uh, external applications, and uh, things that allow you to connect with your environment. So as we move forward, it's, it's ideal to start visualizing post-production workflows in their entirety and using a holistic approach. I apologize, the button is not working. Oh. Okay. So I want to take a moment to review best practices at a high level. The content lake can't function as intended as a master repository without an efficient means to get content into the cloud. The environment won't be scalable without templating workstations and having a mechanism to deploy and manage them at scale. The artist experience won't be performant without high fidelity, low latency access to the remote workstations. And finally, security is job zero. Your content is your business. All content and transactions should be encrypted at rest and in transit. So in order for a cloud content lake to act efficiently as a repository for master production assets, we have to be able to populate it. Each production's requirements and timelines are unique, so one show may require immediate access to camera raw files, whereas another one may function equally efficiently with daily access to mezzanine assets and a periodic dump of raw frames. And that's why there are a variety of tools, both AWS and third party, in order to facilitate different workflows on different budgets. So questions to ask yourself include, how quickly do I need access to my proxy, my mezzanine, or my raw footage? How much bandwidth do I have on set or near set? Will a periodic mass ingest of raw footage suffice if I have daily access to my mezzanine footage? Do I require an online transfer, or will an off uh, offline transfer suffice for certain assets? And what protocols and speeds of ingest are required to meet my SLA? And once all these questions are addressed, we can tailor an ingest solution that's ideal for your production and for your budget. So once footage is ingested to AWS, managed media services can supplement the post-production process. AWS Elemental Media Convert, for instance, can be triggered upon ingest to create streaming proxies, editorial proxies, and viewing copies in an automated manner, removing the human element completely. So this is just a simple example of how that holistic ecosystem and AWS media services can add value and efficiency to the overall workflow. In order to create an environment that's highly scalable, globally reproducible, and easily managed, it becomes critical to template your workstations. And this is done through the creation of Amazon Machine Images, or AMIs. You can create as many as you need for different creative and technical functions on, po on post-production. And then you can preload the appropriate applications, drivers, and plugins. Then deploy them as you scale your team, replicate them as required as your slated productions grow. So let's get real for a second. Not every production has an army of cloud IT professionals, and that makes it critical to build scalability mechanisms into cloud architecture. 
And this includes things like deploying workstations, onboarding new users, assigning workstations to users and teams, spinning down workstations that are not in use for cost efficiency, and providing a single point of entry for artists to log on to. All of these mundane activities can become prohibitively time consuming without a simple central portal through which to manage them all. Arch Platform, for instance, provides a completely managed solution, and its portal can deploy post environments in your account or in theirs. It's simple, it's easy to manage, it's highly scalable, and it's globally reproducible. LeoStream is a connection broker and a workstation management utility that's a little more suited to bespoke customer managed environments that require scalability mechanisms. It too is easy to manage and highly scalable. And then, of course, there's Nimble Studio, which Kyle spoke at length about. Pixel streaming is a slightly more mature segment, and on AWS for M&E, we typically recommend one of Teradici or Nice DCV. Both are GPT encoded streams with their own unique benefits and advantages. Both are authenticated and both are encrypted. Teradici, for instance, has highly sophisticated image compression features that employ multiple codecs for the most efficient transport of pixel data. It also has robust integrations for transporting peripheral data streams, such as Wacom tablets. DCV, on the other hand, supports up to 7.1 channels of audio, so if that's a priority, DCV is the obvious choice. It's also available for no additional charge, as it's an Amazon product. But in reality, they're both more than capable of powering access to the most performant post-production environments in the cloud, just minor differentiating nuances. Let's talk briefly about content security. At AWS, security is job zero. Our infrastructure was purpose-built to satisfy the requirements of military, banks, and other highly sensitive workloads, and it includes being vetted for top secret workloads. We support 98 security standards and compliance certificates, including industry-specific standards like the MPA, the Motion Picture Association's Trusted Partner Network, and the Content Delivery Security Association. At AWS, we employ what's called the shared security model. I'm sure you're all familiar. With AWS being responsible for the security of the cloud, including underlying infrastructure and facilities, physical servers, and virtualization layers, whereas the customer is responsible for security in the cloud, and that includes application layers, proper usage of things like encryption and access management. But it's really a joint effort, and AWS provides customers with the tools and best practices to succeed, including identity and access management, a variety of encryption options, including hardware security modules, audit controls, and logging. So let's take a little look at some architecture. This here is an example of a highly scalable, bespoke editorial environment that employs partners like LeoStream and Cumulo. In this instance, the user connects to the LeoStream gateway, Remember, we talked a little bit about LeoStream and how it acts as a workstation management utility, and that allows the user a single portal to be able to log on. So the LeoStream gateway sits in a public subnet and is accessed through a web browser. The user is authenticated using the LeoStream broker, which is typically connected to an Active Directory for the environment. Once the session is authenticated, the LeoStream gateway initiates the nice DCV session, which passes through the gateway to the EC2 instance. Both the gateway and the broker can sit behind audio scaling groups as required. The Cumulo cluster provides performant and highly scalable file level storage for editorial workloads, and it too is authenticated via Active Directory. And while simple, this architecture is highly scalable, reliable, and performant. And one of the nice things about LeoStream is that it, you can deploy multiple environments in, in different regions, and they can all be managed through a single broker. So this is an example of a VFX studio in the cloud, a bespoke man self-managed environment. And again, going back to that holistic approach, the content lake is key, because from there, we can move things to FSx for Lustre, FSx for Windows, Weka, Edit Share, Cumulo, whatever the, your storage solution of choice is, can all be integrated. Typically, you connect via a thin client or a zero client, like Nice TCV or Teradici. And in this particular environment, we're connecting via Direct Connect or via VPN. It supports Wacom tablets and other critical peripherals, and you would run something like Maya, Nuke, or Cinema 4D in this environment. And then, of course, a ThinkBox uh, render farm launches spot instances in an elastic render farm for cost efficiency and scalable rendering. So as we work to increase the number of workloads that can be effectively run on AWS, we encourage you to start thinking more holistically about migrating post-production workflows to the cloud. That's it for me, and I'm going to introduce Jerry Travers from Pot Family, a company on the forefront of moving animation to the cloud, to do a deeper dive on their Nimble Studio pipeline. Thanks.
Good afternoon. Thank you, Katrina. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I'm, I've just come over from Sydney. Uh, Australia has just opened its border, so it was very easy to come out, which is the first time anyone's been able to leave for about 20 months, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I want to talk about today is, um, is, is basically about this process of, uh, of creating digital content and how it's changing. This is the first time I've been to an AW, an AWS event, and, and I suppose it's recognition of the fact that things are changing. I'm essentially a content guy, a production company, and I work for Pop Family Entertainment, and uh, you know, we have a number of, uh, about a dozen projects in development, and uh, a couple of which I'll go through, uh, and under different genres for film and TV. And we've also got a, a technical division called Dreamlight, which, which uh, the, the production divisions draw on for technology. And at Dreamlight, we're looking to use uh, services, software like uh, Unreal Engine, and uh, as well as AWS Nimble. Um, so pop fiction is, uh, is one of our genres that we deal with. And this is a show that we're doing with a Canadian company as a co-production. And it's the story of Madison Knight, who is a detective who harbors a second life as a serial vigilante, uh, determined to avenge the murder of her father. Uh, so that's a live action series. Another uh, area that we work in is, is Pop Factual. And uh, this is uh, a feature film that we're doing called The First Casualty. This was optioned from a book. And it's, it's, the, it's a drama about the story of an Al Jazeera news crew who who uh, were falsely accused of terrorism and sentenced to seven years jail in, uh, in Egypt. And uh, journalists around the world lobbied to get them all released, and, uh, and they eventually were 426 days later. And uh, speaking of uh, news crews, uh, this next show is a, a news crew from out of space uh, called Alien TV, and they come down to, they're sent to Earth to investigate all the customs and the rituals that us humans do. And, uh, and this was a series that we finished off in the last 12 months of the pandemic, um, uh, the last 12 months of the production. And basically, as, as Kyle mentioned, people worked from home and animation just kept on going. So while the live action industry closed down, animation uh, just kept on uh, going through. And so, you know, it was one of the lessons of the pandemic for us. And uh, people work, worked from home and it worked, uh, it worked quite well. Here's a little clip. Greetings, life from across the cosmos. This is Ixby reporting on the greatest mess in the universe, Earth. Memo. Memo. This next project is a Being Betty Flood is an animated feature film, and this is a, a film that is 3D animation. It has a budget of around 10 million dollars, and it's a universal story of every teenager's search to find themselves, who they can trust and uh, what's the way to navigate things through. It's a journey of self-discovery, identity, and embracing our differences. The story is set in a fairly fantastic, magical world, and Betty and her family uh, are basically fugitives on the run from a, a malicious king. Uh, but it, Betty's world is turned upside down. The king catches up with them, and and captures her family. Uh, so Betty, this 13-year-old uh, hero, uh, has to go and uh, rescue her family and find her true voice in the process of doing that. So we spend a lot of time you know, script writing and working this process through. And uh, um, it's, it's a project that will 
we're working with other uh, producers in, uh, in Ireland and Germany. So the audience for this sort of project is, is basically families and kids, uh, 8 to 14, um, and we like to call it sort of co-viewing. Um, we, we do know that kids in 2021 have never had a more chaotic time in their life. Uh, things have been unpredictable, they've been watching their parents work from home, it's all very strange for them. And so their world is, is, has been quite in a, in a state of flux. Um, the other aspect about kids that we've uh, done some research on is, is that a lot of the attitudes today are, are quite progressive. Kids are interested in the environment, they are interested in racism, they are interested in gender equality. We don't use any of those messages in the storyline of our film, but that shapes who our hero, Betty Flood, actually is. And so that's her character, and we like that sort of progressive, uh, positive role model, because that's essentially what we're trying to do as storytellers, make a positive role model. So these are just some images that I've brought along just to, uh, to show you some of the detail and the complexity in the, in the backgrounds. And the, uh, this particular one is the floods on the run, the, led by a pack of wolves in the gypsy caravan. And uh, there's some particle effects on the light there in the snow and the skidoos. And so that's the sort of uh, you know, depth that we're, and detail that we're looking for uh, in, the, in the art direction. That there is a bit the same, the backgrounds we're rendering those backgrounds in Unreal Engine. That's a venue for some games which, which take place uh, in, in the production. Um, and as much as possible, we are trying to use Unreal Engine uh, for its real-time rendering capability. And, and we're trying to use Unreal at, not just at the pre-vis level, but importantly at the final pixel level. And our final pixel level is, is at 4K. Uh, so just some other images there. That's the, the castle with the inverted waterfall. Uh, King Murkart, he's the bad guy. Um, and there's just some different uh, versions of that. Um, so in terms of the, the creativity required, uh, creativity is not a science. It's not something you can code. It's a collaborative process, and it's fundamentally about back and forth, and it's about communicating with other fellow artists. And after a while, you get it right, but it doesn't necessarily happen straight away. And so the essential thing is, is that we need to have a, an ecosystem that promotes that creative collaboration. Otherwise, we're, we're not, we're not going to make something that feels genuine or feels real. And so this is just an example, I suppose, of some of the work that went in prior to getting to the look of the character design of Betty that we, uh, we're currently, we currently like. Um, and this is uh, Betty's mother, Verushka. Um, and sort of examples of the collaborative process could be we could have a 2D artist doing some of that work in Brisbane. We could have a, a, a modeler doing the, the 3D modeling in Melbourne. And the texture painting could be done by somebody in Auckland. Um, and so uh, they will always be different, different people doing those three different roles. And, uh, and that's something that we sort of uh, you know, want to promote and refine and, uh, and improve on how we can do that in, a, in an organized and seamless way. And so this is what the family of the floods look like, and uh, Ner so Nerlin on the violin is, is dad, and he, uh, he's featured on a, a German violinist called David Garrett, if, uh, if anybody, if there's any Europeans in the room, uh, they'll be familiar with David Garrett, and, uh, and then there's the rest of the siblings, and, uh, and Betty, who is the quite normal one in a fairly crazy family, the dog is, a, is the younger brother, Satanella. So we wanted to do a test shot, uh, so, uh, and because we were all, with Unity, uh, sorry, with Unreal, we were always using their graphics and so forth, and we really needed to have a of our own that we could, 
establish uh, what the situation was. And so uh, this is a small test shot of the... So we, we just recently put that together using Nimble and we've just done a 4K version of, of the same thing, again using Nimble. And for us it was about just testing out how things work uh, with, with our artists and, and it is, you know, I'm happy to say that, you know, we worked through lots of, uh, lots of issues but it, it came on board quite quickly and so we were very happy with it. Um, and so just in terms of the, the, the film project by some numbers, there's basically about 130,000 frames uh, that we'll be making. Uh, there'll be about 150 artists working on the project. Uh, it'll be about 800,000 render hours and we'll store upwards of 200 terabytes of data and we'll roughly have about 4 million files that we need to find at various points in time. And so that's, and obviously not all of those, a majority of those will be working files, but they are required. And so that's sort of some complexity in that project. And so we were looking for, what we wanted to do in this project that was different to Alien TV is we wanted to do the animation in Australia. Uh, in Alien TV, the animation was done in Canada. And so with that in mind, we, we started looking around at what we needed to do to help us achieve that. And we, what we thought we needed was, was we needed some high-end computing power, obviously. And, uh, and we wanted to be able to have workstations that we could adjust to, to the artist. Um, and so we also wanted to manage those, the data and the assets, you know, fairly in a straightforward, simple manner, uh, obviously in a centralised uh, manner. And... Um, Two other things that were important, we wanted to be able to uh, spread the, 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 um, the net for, for our talent, our artist talent, as wide as possible because there is tremendous competition for talent as a result of some of the demand for content that, that uh, Carl mentioned earlier. I mean, Netflix's production budget for this year is, is 17 billion, Disney's is 6 billion, Amazon's is 6 billion. There's, there's a lot of demand uh, for content and what that's making finding the talent to make this ever so harder. And so if we could do that in a distributed fashion, that was of interest. Um, and, and that sort of just plays into that working from home environment. And so as a result of those sorts of things, we discovered and heard about Nimble and um, as Cole mentioned, Nimble was originally started in about 2015 and um, AWS acquired in 2019 and it was relaunched only in April this year. And, um, and so we had a conversation with Nina Walsh in AWS in Sydney who hooked me up with Rex Grignon, the original creator of the project. And I had a conversation with Rex and he said his main goal was to enable the smaller studios like us to have the, the software and the technology that the bigger studios like Pixar enjoy. And I had just finished reading a book by Lawrence Levy on Pixar's early days with Steve Jobs and it resonated, it, it, it made a, a powerful point. And, and so we, we engaged and we got interested. And what we discovered was a lot of things we liked about uh, nimble. Uh, one of them was the fact that there was an attempt to simplify things for the artist and creative community. The people using this are not, uh, are not coders, they're not developers. And so nimble for me was this sort of wrapper that went around all the, 
bells and whistles of AWS and tried and made an attempt to simplify that. And I think it will continue to evolve down that path as well. Obviously, the, the computing power and the rendering goes without saying. The fact that it's scalable is, uh, is tremendous. Um, uh, and as uh, Katrina mentioned, all the security for the files are all, all there. And so those sort of robust things were you know, keyed in and locked in, and they had been well considered. All of the software, all the third-party software that we need to make the film, Maya, Shotgun, Nuke, Houdini, all of that, of course, is available through Nimble, and uh, we can open up those, uh, uh, and we can license those uh, th through Nimble. And then, of course, it, 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 it facilitates the remote working, I would say, in a slightly more industrial, organised manner than, uh, than we'd previously done before. Uh, in terms of a, of a pipeline, um, that there is, is a version of sort of how we've got to go around and do things. And we obviously start out at that script stage and we need, we need storyboards and we need animatics. And uh, we've actually been writing our script for about 18 months. It's gone through about six different drafts, but we've finished our script and uh, it's in the um, storyboarding process uh, at the moment. Those boxes in the blue are the boxes that we're looking to do with using Unreal Engine. And of course, Unreal Engine is, is a game engine, but they are very keen to uh, explore their, uh, their options in the film and TV sector. And so we were very keen to see what we could do with Unreal. And as I said, not just at the pre-vis level, which is tremendously uh, useful, um, but also at a final pixel level as well. And so those blue sections are, are what we intend to use some of Unreal for. And, and I should note, of course, this is a cinema projected end result, and so 4K is where we're heading. That pipeline there is a, quite a simplified version of what we are, what we need, and it is in reality a bit more complicated than that. Um, and so, with, again, with that in mind, we needed to find a simple and flexible solution. Um, something that was more nimble, maybe. Uh, and so, in the process of doing that, we, once we discovered the existence of nimble, we basically started doing some business modeling of comparing our hardware costs our on-premise costs with the nimble costs. And that took quite a bit of time, obviously, to get all the hardware costs and, the, the, uh, and, and sort of that vendor process. Um, uh, it did take some time. So we got to that. One of the interesting things we discovered was that a hybrid model uh, didn't really make much sense for us. So we decided to go all in on nimble. Um, and so this is sort of some of the inputs to our pipeline. And uh, there's various things there. And again, the, the 3D feature, anime, it, it is that collaborative process. And the more we can join up those, that R&D department with the IT department, with the storyboards and the art direction, the more that they can communicate with each other for just the bits that they need to, the greater the level of successful, positive, collaborative outcomes we think we can get. And so we sort of see Nimble as potentially something that can actually improve our communication across the different areas. And we think that that, that might yield some interesting results. Um, just looking at some individual departments here, obviously there's, there's modeling and FX and animation, rigging and so forth. And, and as, as Kyle mentioned, we can dial up those instances uh, dependent on uh, how much computing power each department needs. Uh, the modelling uh, w w will not need much and the, uh, and the lighting will need a significant amount. Uh, and so we can, we can vary that. Um, apologies for the, uh, this next slide, it's somewhat overwhelming. But essentially the point here is, is that some of these stages have got dependencies of things that need to happen before that stage uh, can actually finish. And so, these dependencies are crucial to uh, make sure that they go further down the line. And if we 
uh, late in our dependencies or in our deliveries, that can cause bottlenecks. And bottlenecks can basically stop us from staying on schedule and increase our costs. And we don't want that to happen. And so the, the ability to redeploy instances and redeploy infrastructure assets in Nimble is really straightforward. And we can, we can use that as a tool to help eliminate these bottlenecks, which inevitably happen in, in the creative process. And so, you know, we think that that's kind of interesting from our perspective as well. Um, I just want to talk briefly about sort of uh, rendering. Um, obviously, I've mentioned Unreal Engine, uh, which, you know, is... Uh, but both these renderers are, are GPU renderers. They're both using, uh, you know, uh, graphics cards, uh, which, of course, are, is, is all, as Kyle mentioned, is, uh, is, is available uh, through Nimble. And, um, and, and, and Unreal, of course, has the VPS capacity, the virtual production studio capacity, um, and, and that incredible pre-vis uh, capacity. Redshift is, is just such a uh, quality high-end renderer as well, and so we're using, we're using both of those. Um, on the left there is, is some of the attributes of the current Unreal uh, engine uh, software, which uh, I've, I've already mentioned. And <clears throat> I think there's a version 5 that's, that's coming, it's uh, working its way through to, I'm not sure what the launch date of it is. And uh, look, we're, we're hopeful that there's a few enhancements in there that we can, we can put to good use. We'd like to see some full refractive ray tracing across all the surfaces, especially water, things like that. Um, and there's, there are quite a few changes on the way in version five. And uh, you know, if we could get access to multi-GPU bucket renderings, um, that would be helpful as well. Uh, Redshift already allows us to have eight graphics cards on one node. Um, and so that, that's quite a significant thing. Currently Unreal is, is, is at one. So uh, just digging a bit deeper there, um, GPU rendering has, is, a, is obviously a much more uh, powerful than CPU rendering. Um, and just as an example, in 2014, DreamWorks released How to Train Your Dragon 2, had a box office of 620 million, and it had 90 million render hours. In that same year, Redshift introduced, uh, sorry, Redshift was introduced. If we went to use, to, to render that film today, the same files, we would do that in, in less than 2 million hours. So from 90 down to 2. So what's happening in rendering, there's a lot of change happening in rendering. This here represents, uh, down the bottom is the number of weeks for the schedule of Betty Flood. It's 81 weeks to make. And those bars are the rendering that we need to do per week to stay on schedule. That's that's what we need to do to deliver the program on schedule. And that there is, the blue is the assumption that let's go and buy on-premise equipment. And we'll go and buy that in week 15. And we'll have it all set up, which is quite a bit of work. And what you see there is 70% of that blue is remaining idle for the whole time. The other part of that story is that it's a massive fixed cost. It's a fixed cost to buy that equipment. That equipment depreciates. But businesses like us, they hate, we hate fixed costs. And so fixed costs are, are... If we can avoid fixed costs, we will. But the other aspect of this is the pricing in, and in Nimble is also very important and very critical because everybody's going to do the analysis and people will have different levels of pre-existing hardware. And so there will be different uh, um, take-ups for different people. Uh, just to talk about artist on boarding, Sydney is a wonderful city. Um, it's a beautiful place. It's an expensive city, yet even in the last 12 months of the pandemic, houses in Sydney have actually gone up 30% on average. And so artists and creatives are struggling to actually be able to buy a home. It's very expensive. And so they want to leave Sydney. They want to move out to the regions and that, so that they can buy a house and have a creative profession. It's, it's not, it's not uh, difficult to work out. So we're, we're kind of mindful of that. And with something like Nimble, we can engage artists 
outside the Sydney Basin. We do not need people tethered to uh, the transport infrastructure to come into our studio. And so Australia is a big place. There's 26 million people. Uh, a lot of it is empty, though. Uh, but we can, f you know, the, with latency of around between 12 and 25 milliseconds, we can go as far as indicated on that map quite easily. And I think we can go down to Auckland as well. Um, and so if we can get artists from Alice Springs in the centre of Australia, that would be great because that gives us a bit of diversity. We could get some Indigenous artists. We can get different voices coming onto the screen. And that's what, that's what the buyers want to see. We want diversity on the screen, not just the same uh, white male sort of look. I actually live in the Barossa Valley, which is 1,500 <coughs> kilometres from Sydney. It's a wine region in South Australia. I go into my coffee shop there, and the, the, the young lad serving me, who's 19, he's a 3D animator. He's been animating in his bedroom for the last five years. He's brilliant. Is he going to move to Sydney? There is no way he can move to Sydney. But we could try that talent to see if that talent is worth bringing on board. And Nimble enables that. Uh, some people want to go and live up in Noosa. That's not bad either. Uh, so just finally, the animation production industry is a global industry that relies on international co-productions. And so you often see Australians working with the Canadians, and the Canadians working with the French, and the Germans working with Ireland. And that's because there's all these government-to-government -government official treaties. If Austra and Australia's got some of those you can see on the slide there. And so typically that's how we get animation projects, television or feature financed. And so what that means is, in the, in, is that if we do a co-production with Ireland, they might do 20% of the work and we do 80% of the work, yet Ireland can still call that a 100% Irish production, and we can call it a 100% Australian production. And the reason that's important is because Ireland's in the EU, and the EU have got mandates on local content for all the streamers to try and uh, do something about making sure the culture of Europe remains the same. And so that is a mechanism to do that. And I would urge the nimble people to, to try and see how they can manage that data between regions internationally, because that is a feature of the animation industry and it's one that's likely to never go away. And nimble can really seize that opportunity. And so in closing, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, is, uh, is a, a developing trend in, uh, for cloud production that is just going to, uh, I think, rapidly expand and grow. And I think as an, anim as an animation, uh, from an animation perspective, I'm really pleased that AWS have decided to make the investment into animation. And I think it's, it's going to be good for animation. Because once they get that focus on it, it will be tremendous. Um, and, and finally, just in the spirit of this, I do think that Nimble represents nothing less than a total reinvention of how digital content production pipelines can be put together. Thank you very much. All right, thank, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, just a reminder, here's some of the other M&E sessions uh, that are happening today. If you uh, want to get some exercise and go to Katrina's Chalk Talk, she's going to probably jog over there because it's like, 20 minutes from now. But uh, thanks again for coming. Thanks for the speakers, for Katrina and Jerry for coming in from our, uh, Australia to do this. This is uh, pretty amazing to have a customer come that far for reInvent. So we're going to stick around for some questions if anybody has any. And uh, thanks again for coming.